Hello and welcome to episode 52 of Linux After Dark. I'm Joe. I'm Chris. I'm Gary. And I'm Dalton. Welcome back, chaps. What hardware do we recommend right now in 2023 for a desktop Linux user? I have to caveat this at the top by saying that Entraware is a sponsor of Late Night Linux, so that may color my opinions of this discussion. But this is not a simple question and it's not a simple answer. So where do we even start with this? Obviously, it depends on your needs. Does it have to be new? Well, should it be new is the question. Is it a good idea to buy brand new hardware if you want to run desktop Linux? No, generally not. Not unless you're interested in the possibilities that that hardware might afford and you're experienced, in my opinion. Because more than likely, you're going to get a strong recommendation for Ubuntu, despite all its pros and cons, especially if you're a fairly inexperienced user. You're going to load the latest LTS. And even if you're in a period quite soon after the release date of that LTS, it's likely that some of the hardware either isn't going to function or is going to function badly. And that's going to be a bad impression that you're left with. So he's saying that if you buy, say, I don't know, 13th gen Intel desktop processor and try and record podcasts with it, you're going to get weird pops and clicks for no apparent reason. I don't know, Joe. Would that ever happen? (laughs) I can't imagine why I'm still using my old 9th gen (laughs) Intel machine to talk to you lot and record today, despite the fact that I've got this hugely powerful machine right next to it that I do the editing on and have to use my NAS to shuffle files back and forth. (laughs) You think about the Ryzen processors having problems, even though if you run an operating system they're targeted for, Windows 11 had problems with Ryzen processors and not even super, super new ones when it first came out. And Linux is playing catch up because they don't have that relationship with the manufacturers in the same way usually, unless there's crossover in in the way that the CPUs have been used directly with Linux workloads. But we're talking about desktop Linux users. And you're just not going to know that. The EP stuff that has come out with the 13th gen Intel CPUs, I personally think it would be a bad idea to buy a Windows machine with those in from day one of release and expect smooth running. Or build one, rather. Well, of course. And if you look at Pharonix, every so often there's an article published under that tag, the efficiency and performance cause optimizations. It's to do with the scheduler and the kernel itself. And there are iterative updates and improvements, but you're going on that journey with the kernel development team. (laughs) So (laughs) that would be my first piece of advice is don't buy the thing that has just come out (laughs) unless you're happy to go on that journey with the hardware. I also have another random issue where I can't hear anything until I mute and unmute. I just don't hear anything that I should be hearing, whether it's a call or YouTube or whatever. So. Yeah, I am in full agreement with you, even with the latest kernel, and we've actually just relatively recently had the point release of Ubuntu. I'm sure it'd all be different if I was running Arch. Come on, (laughs) get your emails in now. But even then, like you said, you're kind of tracking the the progress of the hardware. So I think we can all agree that absolutely cutting-edge brand new hardware is probably not the best decision if you want to run Linux. But once we get past that, The strength of Linux is that it can run across a very, very broad range of hardware. So to give you an example, it wouldn't be fun, but it's not the end of the world to run Linux on spinning Rust as your operating system drive. I'm not saying it would be fun. You would notice some slowdown, especially if you have ever used an SSD-based machine. But compare that experience to running a Windows machine in 2023 with spinning Rust. It's just impossible. I'm not going to have it. I'm sure someone will email in and say, no, no, I'm running Windows 11 on spinning Rust. I never notice it slowed down, but no, I'm sorry. If you open up Task Manager, the first thing you notice on Windows is it thrashes the disk on and off. I don't think we actually will get an email from someone who's using Windows on spinning Rust. They can't open Outlook. (laughs) No, but we'll get emails from people who are running Linux on spinning Rust. And that gives me an idea for a challenge. We should do a challenge of like, get a decent-ish laptop, put a spinning Rust drive in it and see how long you can stand it. I don't have any laptops that can accept a hard drive anymore. Really? No, they're all low profile. I don't have anything with a two and a half inch slot. Yeah, the only thing I've got is the T400 that I used for the old hardware challenge recently. And there's no way I'm using that with a spinning Rust. 
well, we're going to get USB 3 caddies and replicate the experience oh. <laughs> the discs in that and then have that as our boot drive. But yeah, I do think that if you have a heavy storage workload, you're obviously going to notice. But for desktop usage, I still think you can just about get away with it. But ideally, you want at least a SATA SSD in that machine. And they're so cheap now, especially as we speak with the surplus of NAND that has hit the warehouses of the world. Now is a brilliant time to buy an SSD, either a SATA SSD or an NVMe one. And you will get an uplift in performance. I bought an SSD, I think it was 120 gigabytes. It was very cheap, no name brand. This was probably three, four, five weeks ago for six pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Please back up your data. Uh, well, look, it would have just been rude not to buy it. I, just, I haven't got any <laughs> use for it, but I just saw it. And I'm like, I'm not going to not buy an SSD for six pounds. I mean, tell that to the stack of one terabyte SSDs that I'll soon have after I upgrade them in my NAS. Yeah. But there's always old laptops that I can chuck them in, is, uh, is my sort of theory for it. And there's often, well, always nothing that I'll miss if it dies. We don't want to go over old ground. We discussed RAM and CPU in a fairly recent episode. And despite some emails in, which is fine if you can get by on four gigs of RAM and, <clears throat> and things like that, I think the baseline for RAM is eight gigs, 16 if you can especially if you're using a web browser, which most people, let's be fair, for desktop workloads, they have loads of browser tabs open. Okay, so all we've got so far is it has to be not a brand new machine. It has to have an SSD, 8 gigs of RAM. Then you get to the nitty gritty stuff, which is a bit more difficult because you can't really tell this when you're buying, which I think is another reason to wait before buying a machine. Let other people who are fairly experienced run LSPCI, run INXI, run all of these things, look for forum posts, and someone will have put a hardware report because something isn't working in Linux. And you'll be able to find, this is going back to my journey of when I was less experienced looking at getting machines running on Linux. Okay, the Wi-Fi card's not working. Okay, let's Google the model of this laptop. Oh, look, here's a forum post. Here's a Reddit post. I've got no Wi-Fi on this machine. And invariably, you will find the answer. So apart from bleeding edge stuff, it's also giving some breathing space for it not even being bleeding edge, but literally for the hardware bill of materials to make it into the hands of enough Linux users so that that body of work is there. You think about Wi-Fi cards. I've generally not had a problem with Intel. Killer Wi-Fi can fuck off. <laughs> Broadcom Wi-Fi can fuck off. Real tech Wi-Fi can fuck off. Media tech could largely fuck off, but they've done quite a lot of work with OpenWRT and the drivers have improved substantially. But this is the kind of thing where it starts to get a little bit more difficult. Look, what we're saying is just buy a five-year-old ThinkPad. That's just the end of this segment. <laughs> just buy a five-year-old ThinkPad. It's going to be fine. I was going to go for an eight-year-old ThinkPad because I think the T450 is great. Well, I think 11th gen is the sweet spot at the moment. 11th mm. gen Intel stuff seems to be really well supported. I've got an X13 Gen 2 ThinkPad that anything I throw on it runs really nicely. And I've got an EliteBook Gen 8 from HP and everything I throw on that runs really nicely. Say, so couple of generations old has always been where I've gone. I had a T420, then I got a T450, and then I had a Mac for a while, and then I got the X13 Gen 2. And anything that is two generations of Intel CPU old as a rule of thumb, seems to have always been well supported for me. Well, it's interesting that the 11th gen Intel was just before the P-Cores and E-Cores. Mm -hmm. It's the last no BS generation of CPU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the maturity of four physical cores on a CPU. The 8th gen introduced it. The battery life was wobbly. There were some issues. You iterate through 10th gen. And I agree with Gary. My daily work machine is running an i7 11th gen, I get eight hours away from the charger with it. I can get through my working day and towards the beginning, so we're talking nearly 18 months ago when I got the machine, there were some interesting little quirks now and then, but now it is super solid and I don't even think about stability issues or any you know niggling little things that might have been going wrong at the beginning. It's all been ironed out and I'm very happy with it. I can hear just the hordes of emails 
saying, what about AMD? What about AMD? Well, if you listen to Linux Matters, I think it was episode one where WinPress was talking about his search for the perfect Linux laptop. And he bought some ThinkPad or other with AMD in. It was all, you know, hunky-dory. And then I clicked the link and looked at it and configured it. It was just eye-wateringly expensive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, you know, fair enough. If this is going to be your primary work tool, then spend all that money. But, like, we said Intel 11th gen. If you want Intel and you want it to be before all of the nonsense with the P cores and E cores. But if you go 7th gen Intel and before, they are dirt cheap because they won't officially run Windows 11. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking for something that is powerful enough and you're on a bit of a budget, I mean, you're talking like 150, 160 quid, I think, for a decent machine. Even less. Even less. You can get a T470S for sub 100 quid now. Really? Whoa. With a 7th gen i5, 8 gigs of RAM. Wow. Sub 100 pounds. Which is perfectly adequate. Yeah, and that would be fine for most people. 1080p screen on them? Yeah, as long as you check the listing properly, yeah. Yeah, none of this 4K nonsense. I mean, yeah, that's another thing. What about screen resolution if you are looking for a higher budget machine? Is it really worth going more than 1080? High DPI is so nice to look at when it works, right? But it doesn't work, right? (laughs) Yeah, when I'm at a high DPI machine, I start doing things like changing the dots per inch for the fonts. I start blowing up the desktop elements. I just can't handle it. it I, I feel like Ken Jong with the, you know, from community, that gift, just like looking and squeezing my eyes, trying to see until I blow everything up. And then I look at it and think, what a waste of time. I've got this incredibly high resolution machine that I'm blowing up the entire interface on just so that I can see it. Well, the text certainly does get sharper and it looks nice, but it, it still just doesn't work right. Even on the framework, I've run it at 150% and that's just... Eh. And those extra pixels are going to suck the battery life. So yep. yeah. you have to ask yourself if, you, if you're going to need them. I don't know. I disagree. I still <laughs> use a 13-inch 1440p display at 100% scaling. How? <laughs> yeah, but you're young. You've got good eyes. Maybe I just get really close to it. Just <laughs> give it a few <laughs> years, Sonny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm looking at my 27-inch 1440p display, and that is perfect for me. I do have to zoom in on a lot of websites, the old control scroll wheel. And sometimes I go to a new website, and it's just like really far away. <laughs> and it's like, like, what's going on? And I have to like scroll, scroll, scroll. Ah, here we go. Or use Firefox uh, reader mode or whatever it's called. And I've just noticed now web.telegram.org that I use, that I've got scaled to 150%, for example, (laughs) because my eyes are terrible. I need glasses, but I refuse to go and get them. I think it comes down to personal preference because I'm definitely the kind of person who just wants the highest resolution single screen that I can get, and I just want to tile stuff on it. But not everybody likes that. My display I daily drive at my desk is a 32-inch 4K display, and I run it 100% scaling. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you see, I would just feel like I was in a clockwork orange if I did that. Yeah. you. How close do you sit to that, Gary? Um, I don't know. Is it like right on the edge of the desk? My desk is about 1.2 metres deep, and it's right at the back of the desk. So what? at least a metre away. That is, I just don't even. I just feel like I'm in the cinema. Yeah, I couldn't do that. Okay, this episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. Kickstart a fresh autumn routine with HelloFresh. HelloFresh handles all the meal planning and shopping to deliver everything you need to cook a tasty meal at home. They do the hard part and you take the credit. Ever wish you could spend less time planning, shopping and cooking for the family and more time with them? From easy time-saving breakfasts and family dinners to kid-approved lunches and tasty snacks, HelloFresh has what it takes to keep everyone, including you, happy and satisfied. Dalton tried HelloFresh and said having all the ingredients together and correctly portioned is super convenient and the great meal selection made it tons of fun to try out new ingredients and techniques. So support the show and go to hellofresh.com slash 50 Linux After Dark and use code 50 Linux After Dark for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. That's hellofresh.com slash 50 Linux After Dark 
and code 50 Linux After Dark for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. Quick bit of admin then. First of all, thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to join those people, you can go to linuxafterdark.net slash support. And for either $5 or $10 a month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed of either just this show or all the shows in the Late Night Linux family. And if you want to get in contact with us, you can email show at linuxafterdark.net. Well, we haven't talked about buying hardware with Linux pre-installed on it. And, you know, I mentioned at the top, Late Night Linux is sponsored by um, Entraware sometimes, about once a month roughly. So I am obviously going to say buy one of their machines. But is it assumed that you're just not going to buy from a Linux vendor? I think part of the problem for me is that when I'm buying a machine for myself, I use it less frequently than a machine my employer might buy. So I'm already going to be biased towards I want something that's a bit cheaper, generally sub 500 quid, and getting something from one of those vendors with the specs that I probably don't need but i think i need (laughs) is always more expensive than just going and buying a three-year-old thinkpad on ebay and honestly for the planet please buy used if you can yeah on linux matters recently mark was saying how he bought his latest mobile phone second user Mm. and the carbon footprint's already been put out there into the world when you do that and there are advantages to this one of my friends has got a starbuck recently And it's incredibly lightweight. And the nice thing about it is we were comparing. I have a a laptop that's not dissimilarly spec'd, but made by Acer. And the difference, there's just the tiny tweaks. You just know that, for example, the BIOS, the BIOS on my Acer machine is hard-coded to only accept certain file names and paths. And that doesn't include, would you believe, Ubuntu properly. So you install Ubuntu and it won't, boot and it doesn't even have enough of an EFI interface to add the EFI manually and set an entry up. So you have to go through this weird rigmarole of getting root access to the EFI partition and copying a perfectly valid (laughs) EFI file into the correct path. And then suddenly it appears and says it's ready to boot. And it is nice to have the peace of mind that that machine is going to arrive and somebody's already been through this process. They know that it boots Linux because they've tested it. But as you said, Gary, it wasn't cheap. And my machine was £30 on eBay. (laughs) 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 Now, I did have to do a bit of like polishing and stuff, but it's got the same CPU. It is a bit chunky. It's got a wide bezel, but Ultimately, the use case is the same. It's something with an 11.6 inch screen that you want to chuck in your backpack. And I don't really care if it gets damaged or lost. It is it is literally a throwaway machine. And certainly my history with running Linux on things has been through hand-me-downs. The idea of buying any new machine when I was a lot younger. One of the things that drew me to Linux was that I could get an old beta going on it. So that's why I haven't bought pre-installed machines before just because i'm i was working with what i had i fully agree if you're going with i need to do work on this thing then absolutely buy it from a pre-installed vendor if you don't want use for some reason because trying to buy something new from lenovo that doesn't ship with linux or dell that doesn't ship with linux and then putting linux on it you're just gonna have so many problems so yeah pre-installed vendors if uh, it's a tax write-off, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> or if you just really have to have the latest specs of stuff, because I've got an Entrowire Apollo that I bought new, and I think that's an 8th gen i7, and the good thing about that is that it has always worked, no matter what I've thrown at it, it's worked. And obviously I'm biased, you know, they pay me to say good things about them or whatever, but like that was a machine that was meant to run Linux. You know, they put it together and got all the firmware working and everything. And there is something to be said for that, I think. You know, rather than just the crapshoot. Look, if you get a ThinkPad, you know, especially, let's say, an eight-year-old ThinkPad, that is going to work perfectly. But if you get some weird, like, I don't know, Huawei Mate book or whatever it's called, or some weird Vivo book from Azus, like, whether that's going to work 100% or not, There's just no way to know, really. Right. It has to have that critical mass of nerds who have bought the thing wanting to run Linux on it who have already done the work for you. Yeah. And by and large, those are ex-off-lease enterprise machines, right? 
Like, I could not guarantee that I could walk into PC World and buy a laptop off the shelf that would run Linux properly. If it's an idea pad or whatever the Lenovo consumer line is, or a Zenbook or something like that, I've done it before where I've seen something really cheap in a sale and bought it and always had a bad time. Because you had that Zenbook, didn't you? Yeah, I had a I had a Zenbook 13, which was yeah, an 11th gen i5, and I had a terrible experience running Linux on it. Oh. It was okay. 90% of stuff worked, but there was always just like the odd thing that didn't work. Like I had one of those infrared webcams for Windows Hello, and Linux tried to recognize that as a webcam. <laughs> so you got this weird, like flickery infrared picture of yourself every time. <laughs> Or it didn't have a headphone jack, and the USB-C audio interface that came with it never worked properly in the Linux. Mm. There were just always little really annoying things like that. Or the touchpad didn't deactivate when you turned the screen 360 degrees round to use it as a touchscreen. Oh. So you put it on your knee and the mouse would still move. So there's always little things like that. And I got that machine £300 off of MSRP in the John Lewis sale or something which is what made me buy it. Yeah, I remember you being quite pleased with it at the time. I was, but it's just slowly all of these little things that don't quite work eat away at you. He's out of the honeymoon period. Yeah, and you're always kind of tinkering and being like, well, what if I put the latest kernel on it? Or what if I try the newest Fedora? Or what if I install Arch? And you might get like, oh, well, this thing works better under this distro, or that thing works better under that distro. But once the honeymoon period's over... It just was never quite there. Did it go on the stack or did you sell it? No, I did sell that. Like I put Windows 11 on it and put it on eBay and sold it for as much as I paid for it about six months nice. into ownership. So that wasn't too bad, but there's definitely machines I've bought like that that I've taken a massive loss on or now just sit in the stack. It's really funny you say that, Gary, because I have an almost parallel experience with a slightly cheaper machine. And again, it was an Asus one that I got refurbished from Argos. And it was to fulfill that, I want to chuck this in my backpack and not worry if it gets stolen. I think it was 80 pounds. So it's reasonably well specced. And it was literally an uh, open box return, untouched. It still had most of the protective wrapping on. Battery was 100% health. When I put the machine into standby and resumed, the touchpad didn't work. And so I had to reboot with the keyboard. And I started looking around and I found a smattering of people and I found a forum thread where people were having the issue. And in the end, it was basically the way that the I2C interface was wired up inside and the firmware and the EFI BIOS and all of the configuration for it. And somebody raised a support ticket with Azus and they just replied and said, we don't support the Linux operating system. Please install Windows where this behaves exactly as you'd expect. And <laughs> I had the exact same thing. I tried kernel updates. I once had a laptop where the Wi-Fi card would do that but I wrote a system D unit that would run when I opened the lid and it would reset network manager and bring everything back online. And I even forgot that I'd written that. So I moved the drive to another machine and wondered why the Wi-Fi kept tripping. And I was like, oh yeah, there's a system D unit running to reset everything. And that worked fine, but this, it just wouldn't budge. And I ended up just selling it again because it annoyed me so much. So in conclusion then, don't buy anything brand new unless it comes pre-installed with Linux and you get actual support for it. Try and buy secondhand generally to save the planet. And if you do, make sure it's a couple of years old. And if you are going to buy secondhand, then buy something that either came with Linux or is really popular and well supported because a load of Linux nerds have tinkered with it, found the problems and fixed them. That's exactly what I was going to say. Go where the nerds are. Well, I don't suppose we'll get much feedback about this. So if you've got some thoughts on it, if you're one of the one or two people who've got opinions on this, then let us know. <laughs> or just go and buy a two-year-old ThinkPad, which has been the advice forever. Yeah. Right, well, we better get out of here then. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Chris. I've been Gary. I would not recommend buying the 11th Jet Framework. <laughs> oh, not that again. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> <laughs>